Welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Teresa Warner and I'm president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists. We are also a leading advocate for press freedom and a great defender of the First Amendment. Today on World Press Freedom Day, we are joining with Freedom House to announce their findings of their annual survey of press freedom around the globe. Freedom of the Press 2012, breakthroughs and pushback in the Middle East. We have a great panel to discuss changes underway in various countries. But first, I would like to introduce Guido Westervella, the Foreign Minister of Germany. A lawyer by profession, Westervella has been serving as Foreign Minister in the Second Cabinet of Chancellor Merkel since October of 2009, and he was Vice Chancellor of Germany from 2009 to 2011. Today, I am pleased to introduce him to speak to us about the importance of press freedom. Mr. Kramer, Ms. Werner, ladies and gentlemen and uh, excellencies, thank you so much for inviting me. This is a great pleasure and a wonderful opportunity to address a few words of solidarity to you and to your work. I think uh, on the occasion of the World Press Freedom Day, I would like first of all to thank you for your work and to encourage you to continue in this direction and I'm delighted and uh, honored that uh, I could make it possible to come to you and to address a few words after your friendly invitation. I think, ladies and gentlemen, of course, in the era of internet, satellite television, smartphones, and social networks in time of Facebook and Twitter, it may seem as if this finally had become a global and globalized reality. Unfortunately, this dream has only come true in parts of the world, not everywhere. We all know in Iran and elsewhere, censorship continues to oppress the free flow of information, to distort facts and to change the perception of reality. Not only in Belarus, journalists still are behind bars for the mere fact that they act according to Article 19. As we speak, journalists have died, have been attacked, and risk being killed while reporting about the bloodshed in Syria. All that reminds us how heavy the responsibilities of journalists are and how precious and dangerous their daily work can be. Democracy is impossible without the freedom of expression and the critical assessment of state actions by a free and investigating press. And probably some people think the freedom of the press is just an issue for some academic elites. And I think it's not, because without freedom of the press, we will not have freedom of expressions, we will not have freedom of opinion. And I grew up in a country where we were not used in part of Germany to the freedom of speech, freedom of expressions, freedom of press. And therefore, of course, my country feels a special responsibility to support your work and to support your engagement. I remember when I had been for my first time in Berlin. I grew up in the Federal Republic. I was born in 61. And I grew up in Bonn, which is the former capital city in the Rhine Valley. Probably some of you have been there. If not, please come. It's great. From my point of view, the most beautiful region in the world, except Washington, of course. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, I remember when my father sponsored me when I was around about 13 years old, 14 years old, when my father sponsored me a trip to Berlin. In those days, the German nation was divided into states. 
and Berlin was divided. There was the free part, so-called West Berlin, with the help and support of the American people and the GIs. This was the free part of Berlin and of Germany. And I was invited to go to the wall. And I remember there was a wooden platform. I was around about 13 or 14 years old. There was a wooden platform on the western side of the wall. And we climbed up and overviewed the wall. And behind the wall, we could not only see gray buildings. What we saw was the so-called death belt with mines in the sand. And this is not 19th century. This is part of my life. This is part of our life. And because Germany is so lucky that we are unified again, because our German reunification was also the European reunification. We feel a special responsibility to human rights, to civil rights, to the freedom of the people, freedom of opinion, expressions, and of course, of the medias and of the press. And always, in the world, wherever these human rights are attacked, the German government will clearly work against this and will clearly stand by the people and their democratic values. Democracy is the result of freedom, and democracy and freedom are two sides of the same coin. And therefore, we will continue to refuse to look the other way when journalists are persecuted and political opponents are oppressed. What we strive to achieve everywhere is particularly significant for millions of people throughout North Africa and the Middle East. With the Arab Spring, fundamental change has come to the Arab world. I have been after the revolution in Cairo two times on the Tahir Square. It was an unforgettable moment for me to meet the people, the protesters, not only the young generation, many people were there, women, men, and they were so happy and delighted after the revolution that we really want to support them that they stay on a positive way and in a good direction. People in the region, in particular, in particular the youth, had the courage to stand up for freedom, dignity, and participation. We will never forget the moving pictures from the Avenue Bogiba in Tunis, or the Tahir Square, like I just mentioned, in Cairo. They showed us the power of freedom, and they taught us how quickly autocratic regimes can collapse in today's globalized world. Nobody knows what the wind of change blowing through North Africa and parts of the Arab world will ultimately bring about. However, we do know what a crucial role the media can play to overcome repression and violence. Thanks to the brave struggle of activists and journalists for free press, today's international community is more than ever able to watch, to get information, to judge, and to act accordingly. The internet, has, the internet has revolutionized the media. Great new technological opportunities have changed information patterns dramatically. In our free society that does not fundamentally change the rules of the game, not so in North Africa, the Middle East, and in other parts of the world, there, new forms of journalism play a crucial role 
in and for civil society. Without them, without Al Jazeera, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and others, it would hardly be possible for us to see and to hear and thus to know what is really going on in Syria, in cities like Oms, Amr, or Idlib. Maybe the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt had not succeeded without these new forms of journalism. Thus, the so-called Arab Spring has already written history, but we are still only at the beginning. The globalization, like we see now, is much more than an economic process. It is also a globalization of values. And this is the real change in the world, the globalization of values. It is the success story of values, what we have in our days. Freedom of the press, democracy, and the rule of law are far from being guaranteed. Most countries in the region are still relying on autocratic structures and media control. We must therefore carry on our struggle for free press worldwide and for freedom of opinion worldwide. So ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, I'm very grateful that you gave me the honor to listen to me and to invite me. It uh, is my opportunity to express how important we think your work is, and we want to encourage you with all our appreciation to continue and to do so, your work in this direction. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> Mrs. Lang. Thank you. He also said he was available for questions, so if anybody has questions, please raise your hand. When I call on you, if you would identify your name and who you are, uh, who your publication is. Questions? This is an easy press conference for you. Uh, oh, we got one right here. If you could state your name, please. And we have a microphone coming in your direction. Yes. Hello. Uh, thank you for your magic words. Uh, Thank you for being here. My name is Tom Dine, and I'm a trustee of Freedom House and have been in the press. Uh, I want to pick up on one thing you said, and I liked your expression, by the way, of globalization of values. It's a wonderful expression. Uh, so let's get back now to the specific, specific Syria. The Western world talks and doesn't do anything. People are getting killed every day. Uh, our values have been wiped out, if you will. Uh, although hopefully they can always come back. Do you foresee the use of force in the coming days? I think the international community and not only the Security Council in New York is really working on a political solution. And I couldn't agree more to what you said in your question. It was, was a question and also, of course, a remark um, that the situation in Syria is really depressing all of us. The question is, how can we give answers? How can we find a solution? And we still think that the Kofi Annan plan is a chance, um, and we should work to implement this Kofi Annan plan. And I would like to invite you to look into the details of this Kofi Annan plan. These are six points. It's more than, of course, finish and the end of the violence and the withdrawal of the heavy weapons. It is also, for example, I think if I remember it correctly, in the fifth point, excess of the media. Because the observers, they have a very responsible position for all of us that we get really serious information and, uh, information and news. So I can only say I think a political solution is still possible. We should work on a political solution. And uh, the German government wants to support the Kofi Annan plan and its implementation. This is what I can answer you at the moment. And of course, we all feel solidarity and sympathy. We shouldn't forget, uh, like I mentioned in my 
little statement before. We shouldn't forget that thousands of people already have done, have died, uh, died, I'm sorry, and uh, among them hundreds of children, hundreds of children. And uh, it is, uh, of course, sometimes frustrating if you sit in Berlin, in Washington, or in New York in the Security Council, you see what's going on, these atrocities, the repression, and it is also necessary, but it is necessary to work on a political solution because we have two goals. The one is to protect the people, and of course, second is we do not want to see a war in the whole region in the sense of a really hot conflict for many other countries. This is what we have to prevent also. Uh, hello, I'm, my name is Tom Reis and I'm a freelance researcher. You mentioned East Germany. Uh, after the, as you know, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Stasi uh, police records were unsealed and people were able to know who was monitoring them, who was informing, you know, activists knew who was informing on them, the media knew who was informing on them. Now in these Arab Spring uh, countries, uh, there's a lot of social media monitoring going on. There's a lot of network monitoring. Uh, so the records are not there. There's, they're just looking at the networks. Do you think there'll be the same chance for accountability of uh, media and free speech repression because of this? Well, I'm, I'm hesitating uh, to compare these both historic issues. What we see now in the region south of Mediterranean Sea and what we saw a bit more than 20 years ago in Germany and in the whole uh, Eastern uh, Europe, in the whole Eastern Europe. I'm hesitating because the situation is totally different. I mean, we are looking, for example, to people. I talk to the people on the Tahir Square, and they ask for democratic participation and for social and economic participation. And I think this is also the key to develop this country. This is the reason why we, in Germany, started an initiative in the European Union, which we called a transformation partnership, which means more for more, but less for less. Uh, the idea is because we, using, we are using the wording Arab Spring like I also did. But if we want to differentiate, if, if we look into the countries, the different countries, we all know there probably are Arab seasons, but not an Arab Spring. So the situation in Morocco is totally different if we compare it to Tunisia or to Egypt. Or look, just look to Algeria or to Libya, and then I'm just in North of Africa. And there are many others, many other countries. Um, so I wouldn't say that we can, can um, give lessons about the management of the history like we had in Germany, because the situation is really from country to country, each country to each country, very different. This is my point. And if you allow me just to make one little remark, you said what everyone says worldwide, the fall of the Berlin Wall. This is what I many times use as a wording, but if we are, if we are looking back, people of my generation, we remember the wall didn't fall. There were people who stood up and they broke the wall. And this makes it different. Only with one instrument, only with one tool, with their clear will at identification for freedom. I think this is probably the best uh, tool what you can have as a citizen in your hand. This is Thomas Gorgisian from Tahrir newspaper, Egyptian newspaper in Egypt. Uh, sir, you mentioned the word that inspiring moments and all these kind of uh, human history and all these glory words. But the reality now is completely different and as you said, it's seasons, but I'm not trying to make a compare and contrast between each other, but I'm just trying to ask you one question. What your country, Germany, with all the experience that they have and the resources they have ready to do to keep that spirit up first, to make it reality and transfer to a democratic and civil so 
nation, not a military rule country. I think this is exactly uh, the concept of the transformation partnership. And because you are working for an Egypt media, you know exactly the discussion in the European Union. Uh, this is exactly the idea of our engagement uh, in Egypt and in the other countries, of course. But if you, with all modesty, let me, let me just say, from my point of view, Egypt is the key country. Egypt is the key country, not only because of Cairo. Egypt is the key country for many things else. And uh, therefore, for example, together with uh, my American colleague, uh, Hillary Clinton, we started to mm, make it possible that, for example, foundations, our political foundations, can continue their work. If we want to be successful, this is really one of the lessons of our history. If we want to be successful with a democratic process, we need a strong civil society. And this includes political education. Not in the sense that we want to bring our religious values to other religions. Of course not. But in the sense that we think political education for the young generation is necessary. Training of journalists, young journalists. I mean, you know them, 17, 18, 20, 25 years old. I met them. And uh, because of the last decades, they do not know what we know, how, a free, how free medias can work and what, what power they have if they work seriously and uh, sensible and responsible, of course. So I think it is a, it is an, it's a comp comprehensive approach what we have. It's an economic support, but it's also the idea to strengthen the civil society because the stability of a country is not the result of the stability of an autocratic government. The stability of a country is the result of the stability of the society. And the society is what counts. Any other Long questions? answer, but a complicated question. Well, then, thank you so much. I wish you all the best. Thank you for your hospitality. And uh, I hope to see you soon again. And good luck for your discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would like to introduce the moderator for today's panel discussion, Mona El Tahawi. She is a New York-based, award-winning columnist and an international public speaker on Arab and Muslim issues. She is a columnist for Canada's Toronto Star and Israel's The, Journalism, the Jerusalem Report. Her opinion pieces have been published frequently in the Washington Post and the International Herald Tribune, and she has appeared as a guest analyst in several media outlets. Before she moved to the U.S. in 2000, Ms. El Tahawi was a reporter in the Middle East for many years, including in Cairo and Jerusalem as a Reuters correspondent, and she reported for various media from Egypt, Israel, Palestine, Libya, Syria, Saudi Arabia, and China. Her public speaking has taken her around the world, and we are pleased that she is with us today. I'm going to turn things over to Mona to introduce the panel. Thank you, Teresa. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Freedom House for bringing us here together to discuss um, these very important issues on World Press Freedom Day. But before I introduce the panel, I would like to recognize David Kramer, the president of Freedom House, and also Will Taft, the chairman of the board. So good morning to you both. And I'm going to keep my, my talking um, very, to very limited sentences to introduce our panel, basically, so we can get right down to things. Our first speaker today is Courtney Ratch, who is the program manager for the Global Freedom of Expression campaign at Freedom House. She's an international media expert with more than 10 years of journalism and new media experience in the US, Middle East, and Europe. And she is currently finishing her dissertation on cyber activism in Egypt. She's doing her PhD at the American University here in DC. So um, welcome, Courtney, and um, we'll start the panel with you. 
All right, well, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, the editor of our Press Freedom Survey, Karin Karlikar, is doing an event in Mexico, so I'm going to have the privilege to share with you some of the findings from what turned out to be a very momentous uh, survey this year, the Freedom of the Press Survey 2012, Breakthroughs and Pushbacks in the Middle East. For the first time in eight years, uh, the negative trend that we've seen with the declines in freedom of expression around the world was stayed, and we actually saw some slight uptick and improvement, in large part due to gains in the Middle East. Um, Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, all went from not free to partly free, which was a pretty momentous change. Um, and we also had countries like Burma uh, that came out from under incredibly oppressive political rule. And what we've seen is that of the 197 countries and territories that we assessed in 2011, including the newest country of South Sudan, a total of 66, or 33.5%, were rated free, 72, or 36.5%, were partly free, and 59, or 30%, were rated not free. So this balance shows a shift towards the partly free category, and you'll, you know, it sounds like there's about a third of the population um, in each category, or a third of the countries in each category. But when you look at the population, it's a bit more dire. We found that only about 14.5% of the world's inhabitants live in a country with a free press where they can um, express themselves, they can be economically independent, the press is economically independent and free from political interference. And this is, of course, incredibly disturbing. Um, and it actually declined to its lowest point since 1996 when we began tracking population data. And as the German foreign minister mentioned in his remarks, new forms of journalism have become incredibly important. And so we've taken this into account in our methodology. And we are taking into account the role that citizen journalists and informal means of journalism play in creating a free press environment. Um, and in terms of regional trends, as I mentioned, some of the most dramatic uh, gains were driven by openings in countries uh, in, North, in Middle East and North Africa, as well as the Asia Pacific region. But they were unfortunately uh, nearly balanced out by negative movements in the regional averages for Central and Eastern Europe, Eurasia and the Americas. And um, we also saw that despite positive news in countries like Egypt and Tunisia, that there has been backsliding uh, since we, you know, the, the report covers the calendar year of 2011, but just today actually on World Press Freedom Day, we got news that Tunisia, um, the Tunisian courts have found Nesma TV guilty. Um, we've also been denied entry, Freedom House has been denied entry into Bahrain to conduct a freedom of expression assessment mission that we were supposed to do with a uh, committee to protect journalists, Reporters Sans Frontières and Penn International. And of course my colleague um, from Egypt is here to talk about the situation there. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the situation Freedom House is, is facing there. So unfortunately what we see is that many of the gains in the levels of freedom this year in the Middle East and North Africa are negative freedoms, not positive freedoms. They emerged because there is a lack of rule of law, there are a lack of some of the legal structures and regulatory structures that restricted press freedom and a lack of political interference. But as we've been seeing this year, that seems to be turning. And what we need to do is consolidate those gains and turn them into positive freedoms by and um, putting them into the Constitution and into the laws and regulatory structures and ensuring that politicians don't interfere in freedom of the press. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude. Thank you very much, Courtney, for your very succinct and to the point presentation. I appreciate that because time is not on our side today. <laughs> um, our first, uh, our next speaker rather on the panel is Nancy Alkeen, who is the uh, country director for Egypt for Freedom House. Many of you might know her from a uh, now iconic photograph in the New York Times in which she stood in a cage along with other defendants reading homage to Catalonia. Very apt for what was happening to her and the other defendants in the NGO trial in Egypt. Uh, Nancy has worked with both uh, the Egyptian government and non-governmental organizations. She was with the Ministry of International Development in Egypt and then with pro-democracy NGOs before she left for the UK where she earned a PhD in international development. And so I now present 
defendant number 34, as she is known. And you will notice that her necklace is a necklace that she designed herself with the cage in which the defendants stand and the number 34 is written on. Nancy, you have five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mon. <laughs> I think you've said enough. <laughs> Um, all right. Uh, well, um, as you've all seen from the report, that Egypt has been upgraded from uh, not free to uh, partly free uh, in the freedom of the press uh, for 2012. But as Courtney indicated, uh, this mainly covers the calendar year of 2011. And uh, this means that this um, gain or upgrade was mainly tenuous, just as everything else we've seen after the inspiring moments that we've witnessed at the beginning of the revolution after the 18 the euphoria of the first 18 days of the uprising, which ended by the fall of, the, of Mubarak. Um, well, maybe I would just try to be brief, but I would just like give you an overview of how the status of the media and the press in Egypt now on two grounds. For, first, the legal framework, and second, the uh, operating environment and the actual practices. So concerning the legal framework, well, by the Constitution, the article entails that everyone is entitled for uh, free freedom of speech and freedom of expression. But when it comes to laws, this is where the problem begins. I mean, because this is what entails, I mean, like what, what is incriminated, what is, what is criminalized or not. So for example, uh, shortly after we've seen the formation of the first uh, cabinet after the, transi uh, after the revolution, uh, in September 2011, we've seen that the Prime Minister issued a decree uh, that uh, criminalizes any act of criticism of the government or the Supreme Council of Armed Forces. Of course, the language of this decree was very loose, so you cannot really identify what is considered as a criticism or insult or what would be criminalized or not. So this is on the, on, on the legal side. On the, on the practical side and on the, the, the operating environment, uh, we've seen at the beginning also the, um, a lot of hope with the establishment of new media outlets, uh, new independent voices coming out and, and taking uh, different um, milieus and, 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 uh, uh, and we've seen new voices coming on the, uh, on the television, on the talk shows, and we also the establishment of new channels. And we've seen also an opportunity with uh, several newspapers are getting licenses to, uh, to, uh, to start a publication, which was not the case before the, Mubar before the fall of the Mubarak regime, um, or maybe Mubarak, just to be precise, not the Mubarak regime <laughs> itself <laughs> as a whole. Uh, but this was short-lived. I mean, this did not continue. Uh, uh, and uh, very soon we've seen that those who are um, uh, in authority or those on the, uh, in power and um, overseeing the transition were not very tolerant of the opposition voices. And we've seen this intolerance in different forms. We've seen it on uh, immediate censorship, where we've heard members of the Supreme Council of Armed Forces calling presenters and talk shows on air and telling them off because they are criticizing the uh, the practices of uh, of the scaf uh, or their attitude uh, we've seen uh, presenters and journalists summoned to uh, military prosecution offices uh, some were uh, uh, um, formally charged, or some were called for a cup of tea, and we all know what this means. So there are different forms of intimidation and cracking down on uh, on journalists. Again, we've also seen a crackdown on uh, many bloggers who were uh, detained and imprisoned. Some of them are very prominent ones. Uh, we've seen the case of, uh, the famous case of Ali Abdel Fattah, who's a, uh, who's a blogger, uh, that because he refused to be prosecuted under the mili uh, military um, uh, framework or the military prosecution, he was punished and he was detained for uh, over, I think, three months. And uh, after that, I mean, at the end, he, he, won, he won the battle at least for being prosecuted under a civil uh, prosecution. 
And the other thing is that uh, we also seen, like, uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Foreign Minister of Germany, that no one will forget the inspiring moments uh, of uh, the Tahrir Square, where the people are like expressing their views and and and, and very active in, in in just combating that regime. But also, we can never also uh, forget moments when we saw uh, military soldiers were with machine guns getting into studios where the presenters are on air, actually. That was last October when the Maspiro events were. There was a clerk down on the sitting of the cops in front of uh, Maspiro in Cairo. So, I mean, it's like, as you see, I mean, like, in, in the overall picture, there were a lot of optimism at the beginning, but then soon we, we saw that the, there is an intolerance uh, for um, for criticism and opposition and mainly media, which is the, 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 the most important tool that the previous regime had and keep on using. And of course, we are directly affected by this and civil society in Egypt was directly affected by this uh, because starting June 2011, we saw a huge uh, media campaign defaming civil society and criminalizing their work. So this smear campaign uh, turned out to be a pretext for the prosecution of civil society organization that came afterwards and we were per personally involved in it. Um, just what is happening and, and the way I see it is that this is a classic way of any regime that is trying to uh, crack down on, on opposition. It's basically, it's a form of isolating the country. And they do this in two ways. First of all, isolating the country by preventing international um, community members, whether journalists or observers or, or witnesses, to come into the country. So this is one way in not issuing licenses or not issuing visas for, for them. And the other way is to foment fears internally against those foreigners, uh, projecting them as or portraying them as spies or as uh, 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 agents of uh, foreign countries trying to implement foreign agendas to uh, um, uh, instigate violence and create instability in the country, which translates at the end as an overall um, uh, sense of xenophobia in the country and leads the citizens themselves attacking or harassing uh, anyone who is foreigner with a camera. And we've seen this several times happening in Egypt. So there are different forms of the classic way of any regime to isolate the country by preventing foreigners from coming inside and fomenting fears inside towards those uh, foreigners. Because this is the biggest fear of any regime is this international attention. I mean, um, at the time of Mubarak, you could have uh, vented as much as you liked locally, and as long as it's in Arabic, yeah, maybe sometimes you were uh, given a warning and summoned for a cup of tea again at the state security, but as long as it's internal, it was in a way tolerated just to keep a face of being democratic. But as soon as this goes out, to the international media, as, as soon as it's in a language that speaks to the international community, this is what they fear the most. And that's why this is our hope, is that to continue reaching out to the international community and communicating our message from inside, but also learning from the practices and the professionalism of media and journalism outside of the country. And uh, just to uh, end on a more optimistic <laughs> note is that as much as there is the crackdown and as much as it's very, very difficult now for any um, journalist to express um, uh, their opinion freely, and uh, just two minutes ago, actually on Twitter, uh, a, a cartoonist was detained in Abbasaya as we speak because he was holding uh, a cartoon picture of the victims of uh, the violence that, that erupted in the past two days. And he, and he was detained and they are trying to find lawyers to get him out. So as much as this is happening, but the hope is that the ones who are in power now are still in the older mindsets and the older tools that they have. I mean, they keep recycling those tools and they um, very quickly run out of them. Where they are opposed on the other side by very young, vibrant 
uh, generation that are very creative. They, they, they invent ways every, uh, every day. Uh, for example, there's a famous uh, campaign that they launched by citizen journalists called Kazibun, or Liars, which is like basically uh, having videos of the atrocities that have been committed by those in authority in Egypt since uh, the fall of Mubarak and until today. And because they know that social media does not reach everyone in Egypt and because we have a high, very high level of illiteracy in the country, they take those videos and go to every district in, in, in Egypt, in every governorate in, in, in the south and in, in, in the north, and try to show those those videos and get people around them and gather them and, and respond to questions and raise awareness about, uh, about what's happening. So as much as there is a crackdown, uh, I still have hope on the creativity of this uh, young generation that does not run out of tools as opposed to the ones who have the, like, the same tools that they have in their hands. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, our next speaker is Margarita Torres from Mexico. For those of you who follow the news, you have followed the, new, the sad news, I'm sure, over the past few months of the deaths and assassinations often of many journalists in Mexico, including just two, day, two days ago, of a well-known female journalist. So Margarita works at the Universidad Abero, okay, my Spanish is non-existent, at a university in Mexico City, where she teaches and coordinates the, the program, the Latin American program for the right to information. She specializes in ethics and journalism, the right to information and professionalism in journalism, with an emphasis on challenges in these areas during periods of violence. So Margarita, you have five minutes to catch us up on what's happening in Mexico. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, as you may know, Mexico, well, in the Freedom House report is uh, considered a not free country for second year. And this is mainly because of the violence we are living in the country. I would like to start saying that uh, the silence of the, of the journalists is also the silence of the society. And this is what, is what we are facing right now. In certain areas of the north of the country, near the border, there are uh, places where journalists just cannot do their jobs. Their life are at risk almost all the time. And it's, uh, last Saturday, we received this very sad um, news that the correspondent or correspondent of Revista Proceso in in the state of Veracruz was murdered in her house. Uh, she uh, was uh, covering social issues. So uh, we are facing a lot of. Uh, I also uh, work in an organization of journalists, and we uh, we realize that we are facing a lot of challenges. Uh, mainly is the aggressions and the and the killings, also the the violence. And with the violence, there's something that is happening. Journalists are in danger because they are covering the violence, but they are also target of the violence. So this has uh, taken us to establish um, a, a, a con to consider certain areas of professionalization that journalists ne need. And this is the physical uh, security, digital security, and also emotional security. Uh, because of the atrocities. Um, the, some newspapers have uh, established uh, specific editorial criteria to covering the violence, to covering uh, the, the war against the, the organized crime, but uh, in certain areas this has moved to the self-censorship, and this is very dangerous for everyone. Um, one of the other things that is very difficult to determine, and uh, a lot of um, reports of the state of the media in the country has established that we are not pretty sure who, has, who is the enemy of journalists right now. And uh, it's, it's very difficult to determine because in some cases is the, the organized crime, in other cases is the local authorities. So it, at certain moments it's very difficult to do the, the, the job and of course to do the investigative journalists. Uh, um, we have, uh, I'm sorry, on Monday, a uh, new law was approved. It's a law to protect journalists and human rights defenders in the country, but um, we are pretty sure that the law will not be enough if the impunity is not ended in the country, because we also had a special mechanism to protect the journalists, and 
it, it started working, it's supposed to be work for, I think, two years, and still we don't have results. So our main issue is to, uh, is that we need a, a guarantee of the work of the journalists, but mainly because we need the information, um, the, the quality of the information for citizens to face the challenges of the, of, of the situation uh, that we are having in the country. Um, I think that will be like the main issues I want to, to, point, to, to point out um, about the situation of, of, um, of, in my country. And also um, another uh, subject that, I, that it's uh, very important for us, as listed in the organization where I work, at, and is to promote that uh, the coverage of the victims that now is in the agenda of the media and it starts a, a year ago but we we need a society also we need to know uh, what are the faces and then what are the voices of the victims that this this uh, violence is creating uh, because well we are uh, right now we are in in an electoral year so this is this will be very important if we want to promote the democracy and the enforcement of the democracy in our country. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. I think what you said about Mexico is also a reminder of something that the German foreign minister said, which is the deliberate targeting of journalists that we're seeing, especially in countries like Syria, where bearing witness to what happens on the ground is such an important role. And that's exactly why journalists are targeted, because those in power and those who want power, don't want that power of bearing witness. And I think it's something to remember as we look not just at, at the world generally, but especially at the countries struggling for these various revolutions in the Middle East and North Africa. So thank you for that reminder. Um, our last speaker on the panel today is Andras Kosa from Hungary. He's the head of the domestic and foreign news department for HVG.Hungary, an online newspaper in his country. Prior to working with this online newspaper, uh, Andras was the deputy editor-in-chief of her, well, my Hungarian is even worse than my Spanish, <laughs> a news website. And before that, he worked as a journalist for the Hungarian political daily newspaper, Magyar Hirlap, which I'm sure I've massacred, where he covered domestic and foreign politics. So Andras, five minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, does it work? Yeah, okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to uh, have this uh, morning with you. Uh, well, actually, uh, luckily, I, doing my everyday job, I don't have to face uh, such a serious problems that my colleagues mentioned, so uh, I don't have to afraid of uh, physical repression, I don't have to afraid of, uh, of detention. But uh, unfortunately, um, Hungary uh, was a country uh, of the Freedom House survey uh, that uh, became, uh, that, that backlashed from the free uh, to the partly free category uh, as a member of the European Union, actually. And uh, as uh, 20 years ago, uh, maybe some of you uh, remember to it, uh, my country was the leading force of the whole democratic transition of Europe, actually. Now, uh, unfortunately, in, I, in my opinion, in the last two years, it uh, started to head to a very different way. Uh, since uh, our problems uh, concerning media, uh, media freedom are mostly uh, political and legal, uh, let me just have a, a few sentences, uh, give you a, a broader uh, context uh, of it. So in 2010, we had the last elections and uh, uh, Fidesz, a conservative party, gained uh, a supermajority, a two-third two majority in the parliament. And uh, since then, they use, uh, and I can tell you in some, in many cases, they abuse their power, actually. So they eliminated the checks and balances uh, of the, of the uh, political system. Uh, they, uh, they created a brand new constitution without uh, the, uh, the opposition. Uh, and uh, they put their own uh, members, uh, so former Fidesz members, uh, in, in many various uh, very uh, important uh, national institutions like National Audit Office, uh, the uh, uh, Budgetary uh, Council, uh, the Public Prosecutor, uh, or for example, the um, um, leading body of the jurisdiction. Uh, sorry, actually, uh, the last one was actually a, a wife of a Fidesz leader. So, uh, <clears throat> um, and uh, 
they uh, changed the, the, the legal framework actually of the, of the media and uh, passed uh, through the uh, parliament into very controversial uh, media law. Uh, which uh, the one of them is created actually a new authority, uh, the National, Ma National Media Authority. Uh, the leading of uh, this authority is a former Fidesz member as well. He is nominated, he is appointed for nine years uh, with a two-third majority, and uh, he has a very broad competence actually. And uh, there is uh, the other body, the Media Council, uh, that is consists of uh, uh, five nominees, all of them delegated from the Fidesz, actually, so without the support of the opposition. And uh, these, uh, these two bodies have a very broad authority uh, concerning the, uh, the media. In, by the original uh, version of, of the law, uh, for example, they should fine, uh, uh, they should levy a very huge fines uh, if uh, they, uh, they, they thought uh, media coverage is uh, so-called unbalanced. Uh, for example, these fines could reach as, uh, I would tell it in dollar actually, so uh, the maximum for a, a national circulated daily newspaper or, uh, or an online newspaper like my one, so the maximum fine uh, could, uh, could have been uh, $120,000 actually, so, uh, which is very huge, uh, uh, counting the Hungarian circumstances. Um, well, luckily, uh, the uh, last December, uh, the Constitutional Court uh, lifted some part of this uh, of this uh, 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 act and uh, and uh, revoked the media uh, authorities right uh, uh, to, um, uh, to 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 uh, make such a fines in uh, online and uh, print uh, media outlets, but it's still they have the competition uh, to find uh, the televisions, for example. Um, last year, uh, actually, uh, uh, the nominees of the Fidesz uh, took over the public media, the public radio, the public television, and uh, the national news agency and. Uh, at the same time, they dismissed uh, more than 1,000 people uh, from these, and uh, because there, uh, b because of uh, the so-called budget cuts. But uh, in this year, for example, uh, they allocated 10% uh, more money actually uh, to these uh, public medium than it was before. Um, so, um, because of this huge uh, dismission and, and the new leaders, uh, I can't. Um, so, there is a strong uh, 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 mood uh, for self censorship uh, for, uh, for the journalists and editors uh, of the public medium. Um, that could drive them some very ridiculous situations, actually. So, it, that happened uh, last year that. Uh, there was a, a news coverage uh, about a conference and uh, one of uh, the previous uh, chief uh, 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 jurisdiction uh, leader uh, appeared there and uh, personally one of the uh, leaders of the public television uh, didn't like him so uh, he asked uh, actually uh, to the editors to blur his face uh, from the coverage so and uh, um, protesting against it some um, some uh, editors and journalists of the um, national uh, television went to a hunger strike and uh, they were dismissed of course uh, <clears throat> as well um, the other is uh, the other uh, big problem is uh, concerning the radio frequencies. Actually, uh, for example, I can tell you just one small example uh, because I know my time is uh, more or less over. So, uh, there is a radio station. It's called Club Radio, uh, which is famous for its uh, harsh critics of the government, and uh, their frequency, uh, radio frequency, expired um, at the end of uh, uh, 2010, and from that time. They get just uh, a, a three-month uh, temporary license from time to time, uh, which makes uh, makes their job actually very uh, very hard. And uh, and uh, the, the the media body uh, launched a new tender for this frequency, but. Uh, 
uh, not for a commentary, not for a, uh, for a politically actually uh, oriented, oriented radio, but uh, for a mostly music oriented. So um, I think uh, it's a, there is a kind of intention uh, behind it that uh, they would like to, to, to silence the, the critical voices towards the government. Uh, well, that's it at the moment, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Andres. I'd also like to salute all our panelists for their courage and for their continued advocacy of uh, advocacy in the case of Courtney and Nancy, but in the case of uh, Margarita and Andres, pushing for greater press freedoms uh, in the most challenging of times. And these are issues that are very close to my heart personally and professionally, because some of you might know that in, in close to Tahrir Square last November, Egyptian riot police broke both my arms and sexually assaulted me, and I was detained for 12 hours by the police and the military. So these are issues that, that touch many of us very closely. So I salute you all for your wonderful and courageous work. And now keeping an eye on the clock where I have a plane to catch and I'm the moderator, so I get to boss you around. I'm gonna open the floor to questions now, but um, I would urge you to keep your question under a minute because if you don't, I will stop you. Because we, we would love to hear your, your questions, comments, make them questions, please so that I can put them to the audience, um, the, the panel, sorry. Um, so, first question, who wants to set us off? Okay, I see a gentleman right here. Is there a mic that will go to him? Please identify yourself and who you're affiliated with, and if there's a person you direct your question to, tell them. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Andrei Sereni from the Embassy of Hungary, uh, and uh, I would like to uh, thank you uh, and the organizers for this panel, and uh, Mr. Kosha for, for the comments. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I, I feel obliged to, uh, to make a short remark at the beginning. Uh, namely under a minute or I will stop? Under a minute. Um, and the remark is very short. Um, I would like to ask uh, Freedom House, uh, whose work we appreciate a lot, uh, to pay attention to not base the report on factual mistakes and uh, incorrect legal interpretations, uh, because uh, it's not part of the methodology uh, they, they describe. Uh, but unfortunately, there are several in the report. Uh, and that just to, um, to answer um, uh, or to ask uh, Mr. Kosha, uh, two, two of the examples uh, you mentioned uh, are factually incorrect. Uh, for unbalanced coverage uh, in the Hungarian media law, you cannot be fined. Uh, I, I urge everybody to read the legislation. Uh, and uh, Club Radio uh, entered the bid they lost in Hungary, and there is a, a procedure in court, which is part of the rule of law, uh, which is ongoing, so there's no final decision yet. And then the question, uh, under one minute, um, how do you uh, describe the role of the partly free media in the resignation of the president uh, based on a scandal, a very reasonable one, uh, launched by your online newspaper, if I can remember correctly. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, thank you for advertising my newspaper, actually, at first. <laughs> Uh, well, for the first remark, I think it's not my job to answer it, but uh, actually, uh, I, I didn't mention that uh, I just checked the news uh, before I came here in my uh, hotel room, and actually uh, the undersecretary uh, charge uh, for um, communication made some very harsh uh, comments, actually, about the... Uh, Freedom House uh, news survey, so uh, it, it could a very big, uh, it, it, it caused actually huge waves in Hungary, so uh, you, you made a good job, so. <clears throat> uh, okay, well, um, actually, so I, I mentioned um, in, in my small speech that uh, in some part of the, of the law was lifted by the constitutional court, uh, but actually I've uh, I can tell, uh, I need to tell you, I just checked uh, the, 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 the home page of the National Media Authority and they still have uh, the old version of the act uh, on their home page, so maybe it's their job uh, uh, to, uh, to refresh it now. Um, and yeah, okay, so uh, your question, uh, well, um, okay, of course, uh, we could raise uh, these uh, uh, stories, so just in a few words, uh, we raised the story that uh, our president, or now our former president, uh, copied uh, almost 100% uh, of his doctorate, and uh, that caused a very uh, 
raised a very big political scandal, so he finally uh, had to step down. Um, well, I can tell you, uh, we raised it very clearly, so we didn't have to face any problem uh, with it. Um, actually, I think it's not the part of the of the story that I've uh, that I've spoken about. So uh, journalists can uh, can work. Uh, free circumstances, more or less, uh, in, in in the independent journals. Uh, on the other side, actually, is that, uh, for example, uh, state-owned companies uh, advertising just in some certain uh, certain radio stations, certain TV stations, uh, certain uh, newspapers who are in favor of the government, uh, and uh, some opposition journalists are lack of these opportunity. So. Um, but uh, to give you a short answer, yeah, of, yeah uh, we, could, we could work freely, actually, uh, on this story, so it wasn't a problem. Thank um, you. And maybe I could just address uh, something about the report, just to clarify. I mean, Hungary was on the very edge of free. It was at 30 and moved down to 36 to partly free. And that, rec that reflects a general decline in the Hungarian media environment due to the impact of legal and regulatory changes introduced in 2010. But we know those impact um, can take a time to uh, to have effect. And also, um, you mentioned that one of the laws is still a draft law, but I can tell you, um, as a journalist who used to work in the United Arab Emirates, when a press law was introduced that would have imposed serious fines and jail time on journalists, even though it remained a draft law, it nonetheless had a very important impact. And I actually lost my job um, because of an article I wrote. And we know that laws have an impact both when they're in place, but also when they're being discussed. Um, certainly, if you believe that there are factual errors, we're happy to consider those. But um, this is a pretty rigorous methodological study that we do. And um, I think that it's great for us to hear that the governments are looking at this and that, and that you care, because we also care. The reason that we do this survey is to raise awareness about what um, democratic governments and non-democratic governments can do to improve their press freedom environment. And so look forward to continuing that discussion with you later. Just a very short remark, actually, sorry, uh, by the end. So uh, you want to actually that uh, the expression, if there is a gun on the stage, actually, uh, one time it will be used. So um, I think in more or less, uh, the situation could be comparable uh, to Hungary. So actually, uh, there are these two media regulatory bodies with a huge competence, uh, which are, uh, haven't been used uh, in a full scale yet. But uh, there is the opportunity to be used, it, actually. Thanks. OK. Um, any other questions? Oh, yeah, please. I see, yes, the gentleman at the back. Thank you. Uh, hello. I have a question about uh, blog, the blogosphere in Mexico. Uh, could, you, as, could you let us know who you are, please? I'm uh, Tom Reisen. I'm a freelance researcher. Thank you. And <clears throat> about the blogosphere in Mexico, you mentioned that self-censorship has been an issue because of the gangs and uh, because of the violence in Mexico. How do you see the role of the growing blogosphere in Mexico as a counterpart to some of the newspapers that have faced uh, repression and uh, threats? Yeah, well, uh, I think there are different perspectives because in for example, um, uh, websites like um, Blog del Narco, there's Blog of the Narco, arise, and, and we are not pretty sure who is, uh, who is, who is behind the blog, but uh, it start working as an alternative source of news, of, uh, uh, link it with the uh, um, drug cartels and the, the violence in certain areas of the of the of the country. Uh, but I I would like I would prefer to talk about uh, what is the social media doing uh, in in Mexico. In certain areas cities um, because of the silence the journalists were and the media were forced to um, was forced to uh, the the citizens start using social media to report uh, what was happening in in their cities, and it became uh, and it is a source of information of of the journalists right now. I'm, they journalists still needs the sorry I can see the the guy who no, it's okay it's okay uh, uh, 
uh, journalist needs the, the tools to uh, verify the information, but the, the, what is happening in social media is very important because it's helping journalists as, an, as a source of information. Other issue that is happening in, it's not in all the country, but in certain areas, I, and I want to, to be very uh, emphatic in this, is that uh, also, for example, in Veracruz last year, uh, to, to Two persons were accused of a disturbance of the public. Uh, I'm sorry, it's like the public order mm -hmm. because they something they tweeted, and they were accused and they were in jail. And then the governor gave a step back. But uh, it is it is it is an issue right now because it's changing the process. It's changing how how citizens are communicating among each other because of the violence in certain parts of the city is also becoming a source of information of the journalists and it's also uh, generating certain t kind of alarm in, in the authorities because at the end we want to understand what, what is going on and citizens are looking for, are trying to use different sources uh, and different uh, ways to, to know uh, what is happening. And also, well, something happened last year that it's a, certain uh, bloggers and users of uh, the social networks uh, were intimidated by the organized crime. So it's a, um, it's a very complex situation and we, in the Mexican case, we will have to check it like a part by part because it's not the same thing what is happening in the north, it's not the same thing what is happening in the south, it's not the same thing that is happening in Mexico City. So. Uh, if you want, I can give you more information about that. But uh, but it's very complex. What is what is happening? Um, actually, in the in the indicators of how many journalists have been killed last year, there are cert it, certain numbers. Numbers are are different because of the. Uh, who is considered a journalist, and, and, and some consider the blogger, and others don't. But yeah, that is a very and, and it's a real, real challenge. Uh, I, in my first intervention, I'll talk about the, the, the professionalization of, of journalists, and we are considering also the digital part, because it's a it's a tool. Um, of course, we know that it's a very new tool, and all the journalists must uh, learn how to use social media and all the digital tools, but. Uh, how to use it, how to consider it when covering the violence. So it's a, it's a very interesting issue. I hope I answered your question. Thank you, Margarita. Any more questions? Yes, I see here a hand and I see Thomas as well. So we'll start with you. Uh, Santiago Tabra from Notimex, a Mexican news agency. Uh, this is a question for, about the United States, the condition of the freedom of the press. You mentioned in your report a uh, lack of diversity and lack of protection of sources. I don't, I don't know if you can comment on that. Um, sure. One of the um, challenges here in the United States is the economic consolidation in, and the increasingly uh, dire economic situation for newspapers in particular, um, the closure of independent outlets. And uh, we still lack a federal shield law. Um, there are some states that have shield law, which essentially allows a journalist to protect their sources. But we've also seen um, you know, attempts to create legal mechanisms and use, for example, some of the anti-terrorism laws uh, as a way to get information from journalists. And so you know, I think one of the things that our, our survey underscores is that you know, especially in the case of Hungary and the United States, um, is that even consolidated democracies face challenges in protecting freedom of expression and freedom of the press. And as you know, our survey looks at the entire environment. Um, so it looks at the political, legal, and economic environment because it really is about the media ecosystem that presents a free press. Um, in some cases, you know, it's attacks on journalists that, that cause press freedom to decline, and in other cases, it's the decline of um, the economic conditions that support a free press. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions. So I saw a hand over here, Thomas, and then I see the young woman over there, and I think that will do Thomas it. Thomas Gorgisian, Tahrir newspaper. Uh, Margarita raised the issue of who is the enemy of media these days. I mean, and 
that's a good question to be asked, and I'm not trying to answer, but I'm trying to mention one of the things that besides the authorities are other factors, as in the case of the Arab Spring, is like the Islamist or nationalist, super nationalist, whatever, and they are trying to oppress that freedom of expression. The same time, Margita said that there is a worry of about the self-censorship and the silence of the journalist. And Nancy mentioned the issue of international awareness and the isolation of uh, isolating the country. How Freedom House can avoid or meet these challenges? Um, well, Freedom House, as you know, uh, produces this annual survey, which is some, some of our analytical work done out of our New York office. But we also have a significant element of programming. Um, we do programming around the world in Egypt and the Middle East, as well as every other region in the world. And um, I myself run our program uh, Freedom of Expression campaign. And one of the things that we do is provide uh, support to local activists and groups on the ground that are promoting freedom of expression. We help build their capacity to advocate on the issue at both the national and the international level. So helping them figure out how to use, for example, UN mechanisms and, and other mechanisms that will help strengthen international norms to make it more difficult for governments to restrict freedom of expression and, and create this isolating situation. Um, and you know, we, we do trainings, uh, we do support. We have, obviously, on our website several details. But one of the unique things about Freedom House is that we do the analysis we do action, which is programming on the ground, and we do advocacy. And so we really think that taking this comprehensive um, triangulatory approach to promoting free expression and democ democracy and human rights around the world, um, we hope will help improve the situation. Okay, and for our final question, the woman here on the side. Do you have a mic? Excellent. Hi, my name is Sasha Scott. I'm an independent producer, and I had a question for Dr. O'Kale. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about your personal experience with the situation and maybe the toll it's taken on your family to do the kind of work that you do. Um, and I was wondering, even in free media, the US media, for example, do you feel like you're able to sufficiently tell your story in a way that a reader really understands um, let alone if you were able to do that in Egyptian media or elsewhere in the Middle Eastern media. And how can even a free press cover your story more adequately to where you feel like people have all the information they need to know about your story? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, well, uh, of, of course, on, on the personal level, I mean, it, it took a toll on me and my family, but I, I always would like to remind everyone that this is not just me. There are 14 Egyptians uh, that stand in the cage uh, back home, and uh, they are the finest of Egyptian youth. And uh, um, well, in addition to Rob Becker, who's the American who, who remained uh, back there, uh, the trouble is, is that at the beginning, when we were first summoned for uh, for interrogation and prosecution. Uh, I can speak for myself. I was I was glad to just to, to just go and and stand my case, and because we were very confident that we are innocent, we did not break the law in any ways. But at the same time, you're operating in an environment that is not governed by a rule of law. It's a very, very much still an impunitive culture with many stress uh, threats and you and risks, and you don't know really. You don't have a clarity about your rights, and you don't have a clarity about the process that you're going through, and where it starts and how it ends. Uh, so this uncertainty is the most uh, fearful thing that uh, we go through. We are subject uh, to uh, several means of harassment, and not just um, not just because of the legal case, but also there are other things that happen on the side that on a daily basis that really makes it hard to live normally. Like for for example, one day after we we knew that we were indicted, which we knew about through Twitter, by the way, not through formal means, uh, I found people calling me. It's like we saw your name on Twitter that you're being indicted in a in a legal case. Uh, but after that, uh, one night we found that um, uh, all the all the people on the list uh, had their names, their personal home addresses, and ID numbers, and 
very specific information uh, published on a website. So this is very scary. You can imagine, I mean, w what kind of threat this puts when you have at the same time, I mean, this information published and at the same time state media portraying us as spies and we're, we're conducting acts of espionage and uh, what this may entail. So, and the fact that we know we don't know when when this process is going to end, uh, how it's going to end, and our lives are just hanging there. Uh, myself and another uh, fellow defendant in the cage who are considered the oldest of the four team. The rest are just in the beginning of their twenties and just beginning their their careers. Uh, some of them were not even working on any political issues. They were finance officers or accountants and their career will basically be jeopardized by any me any uh, kind of conviction, even if it's a fine or a suspended sentence that is like good enough to just end their, their career and their future, let alone how this is affecting uh, the reputation with the rest of the population. Maybe, maybe the community of civil society in Egypt understand the situation and they have been suffering as well as, as much as we are suffering from what's going on. But the rest of the Egyptian public basically get their information mainly from the state controlled media, I mean, which is defaming us and, and portraying us again as, as spies. So I mean, in their communities, I mean, they are uh, harassed and, and, and threatened and, and subject to all sorts of risks. Um, as for um, access to, to media, um, well, I, well, I've been fortunate, especially when I came here to the U.S., I've been having like um, access to uh, some very prominent um, uh, uh, media outlets, and uh, I had uh, like. I had an opportunity to tell my story, not because it is about me, but it's about, uh, I mean, the the ways things are in Egypt right now, because not everyone understands how what is what is going on inside the country. Uh, we, I'm trying to also uh, just uh, conduct some advocacy work on uh, Capitol Hill and speak to some of the policymakers, uh, and to raise awareness about the issue because. When high-level officials visit the, the countries, and I'm not speaking just about Egypt, but all, all, the, all the countries in the, in the region, just by the fact that they are going on an official mission, by, by default, they would be meeting the officials. And this is the story they hear. They don't usually get to hear the story of the activists or the people on the ground and how, how they suffer. So being here, telling the story, having access to international media is like not just, I'm not just doing this for myself, but also for, for the rest of the people in the case and also for for the future of civil society in, in Egypt because, I mean, this case is not targeted at just those particular individuals in the cage, but also, but mainly as an example to create a chilling effect for, for the rest of the uh, Egyptians and whoever would dare to follow that path and, and, and ha conduct any um, democracy and, and, and rights advocacy work. So, thank you, Nancy. Yeah. I think it's important to remember that Nancy chose to stand trial because she could have left Egypt before she had to enter that cage at the beginning of the trial. So for that, I salute her even more for her courage and for her solidarity with her fellow defendants. Now, some of you might know that I'm quite a fierce feminist, so I'm very glad that this is one of the few panels that you'll see where there are more women than men. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for that, I salute Freedom House. And, and in the name of that fierce feminism, I'm gonna take one more question from a woman because we have had some inequality for the, you know, regarding the questions. So there is a woman, I believe, under the light over there who has a question. Please go ahead. Hi, my name's Caroline Crouch uh, from Georgetown. And I just had a question um, You've mentioned several times restrictions on bloggers who are getting arrested or we see sort of the effects after they've been blogging. I was wondering about capabilities in these different cases to actually do restrictions from the technological side. Are you seeing websites being blocked? Um, is that possible in a lot of these situations? How is that playing out on Facebook and different places like that? Are you interested in um, globally or mainly in Egypt? In Egypt in particular. Okay, because just to throw this out there, we have a separate report on called Freedom on the Net, which looks at specific countries in depth on their level of internet freedom, which includes access, surveillance, censorship. Egypt is one of those countries, but why don't you take that? Well, 
Yes, and, and there is continuous crackdown on, on, on all those outlets and, and, and ways um, to just um, uh, not just uh, cut those means, but also monitoring them and, and, and also harass the bloggers uh, um, online. Uh, we, we have something that is very familiar in Egypt called the Electronic Committee, which was basically formed at the time, the NDP, it was a formal committee that basically formed of like uh, high tech kind of uh, individuals who uh, harass bloggers or, uh, or people from the opposition online and pretending, uh, I mean, creating fake accounts and harassing people and and putting, like, uh, misinform uh, the people about the the intentions again of of those bloggers and and who they belong to, and the uh, and the the opinions they present, uh, but at the same time uh, we get uh, like very creative. I mean, uh, a young generation that try to always get around the the those means of of curtailing their ability to access the internet. And we also need to remember that when the Mubarak regime uh, completely cut off any uh, uh, communications, uh, internet, mobile phones in the 18 days, uh, at the beginning of the 18 days of, of the revolution, uh, this actually had an adverse effect. I mean, they were stupid enough to do that, so people actually went to Tahrir Square more <laughs> to see what's going on. So uh, it's, it's just um, when, when there is a will and when there is this creativity and in, in a, a need for the people to really stand up for um, for their rights to express themselves and have the, the freedom of expression, um, it's it's very hard to. I mean, you you can limit that for for a time, but it's not sustainable. I mean, it's just like you always find ways to go around it, and it, and so also it helps when there is an international community watching over what's happening, and this is the biggest support that that is needed actually. Okay, thank you very much to all our panelists, and thank you in the audience for your questions and for your interest. And I wish everybody a wonderful World Press Freedom Day. Thank you. Thank you.